Welcome to Catholic Culture Audiobooks, a production of catholicculture.org and under the patronage of St. John Henry Newman. Today's reading, Letter to Januarius, by St. Augustine of Hippo, translated by Sister Wilfred Parsons, S.N.D., narrated by James T. Majewski. Augustine gives greeting in the Lord to his most beloved son, Januarius. I should prefer to know beforehand what answer you would give to the questions you have asked me. In that way, I could answer much more briefly by approving or correcting your answers, as it would be very easy for me to agree with you or set you right. This, as I said, is what I should prefer. But in answering you now, I have preferred to make my answer longer than my delay. In the first place, I want you to hold as the basic truth of this discussion that our Lord Jesus Christ, as he himself said in the Gospel, has subjected us to his yoke and his burden, which are light. Therefore, he has laid on the society of his new people the obligation of sacraments, very few in number, very easy of observance, most sublime in their meaning. As, for example, baptism, hallowed by the name of the Trinity, communion of his body and his blood, and whatever else is commended in the canonical writings, with the exception of those burdens found in the five books of Moses, which imposed on the ancient people a servitude in accord with their character and the prophetic times in which they lived. But regarding those other observances which we keep and all the world keeps, and which do not derive from scripture but from tradition, we are given to understand that they have been ordained or recommended to be kept by the apostles themselves, or by plenary councils, whose authority is well founded in the church. Such are the annual commemorations of the Lord's passion, resurrection, and ascension into heaven, the descent of the Holy Spirit from heaven, and other such observances as are kept by the universal church wherever it is found. As to other customs, however, which differ according to country and locality, as the fact that some fast on Saturday, others do not. Some receive daily the body and blood of the Lord, others receive it on certain days. In some places, no day is omitted in the offering of the holy sacrifice. In others, it is offered only on Saturday and Sunday, or even only on Sunday, and other such differences as may be noted. There is freedom in all these matters, and there is no better rule for the earnest and prudent Christian than to act as he sees the church act wherever he is staying. What is proved to be against neither faith nor morals is to be considered optional, and is to be observed with due regard for the group in which he lives. I believe you heard this some time ago, but I am nevertheless repeating it now. My mother, who had followed me to Milan, found that the church there did not fast on Saturday. She began to be anxious and uncertain as to what she should do. I was not then concerned with such things, but for her sake I consulted on this matter that man of most blessed memory, Ambrose. He answered that he could teach me nothing but what he himself did, because if he knew anything better, he would do it. When I thought that he wished to impose his views on us solely by his own authority without giving any reason, he followed up and said to me, When I go to Rome, I fast on Saturday, but here I do not. Do you also follow the custom of whatever church you attend if you do not want to give or receive scandal? When I told this to my mother, she willingly accepted it, and recalling the advice over and over again, I have always esteemed it as something given by a heavenly oracle, for I have often experienced with grief and dismay that the weak are deeply disturbed by the aggressive obstinacy or superstitious fears of certain brethren, who stir up such controversial questions that they think nothing is right except what they do themselves. And these are things of such sort that they are not prescribed by the authority of Holy Scripture nor by the tradition of the universal church, and they serve no good purpose of amending one's life, but they are insisted on simply because somebody thinks out a reason for them, or because a man was accustomed to do so in his own country, 
or because he saw things done somewhere on a pilgrimage and he esteemed them to be more correct because they were further from his own usage. Someone will say that the Eucharist is not to be received every day. You ask, why? Because, he says, those days are to be chosen on which a man lives with greater purity and self-restraint so as to approach so great a sacrament worthily. For he that eateth unworthily eateth and drinketh judgment to himself. Another, on the other hand, says, Not at all. If the wound of sin and the onset of disease are so great that such remedies are to be postponed, then every one should be debarred from the altar by the authority of the bishop in order to do penance and to be reconciled by the same authority. For this is to receive unworthily, if one receives at a time when he ought to do penance. But he should not deprive himself of communion or restore it to himself and his own wish and will. But if his sins are not so great that a man is judged fit for excommunication, he ought not to cut himself off from the daily remedy of the Lord's body. With good reason, perhaps, does someone break off the quarrel by exhorting them to remain, first of all, in the peace of Christ. Let each one do what he thinks he ought to do according to his faith and devotion. Let neither of them dishonor the body and blood of the Lord, but vie with each other in honoring this life-giving sacrament. For there was no quarrel between Zacchaeus and the centurion, nor did one set himself above the other when one, rejoicing, received the Lord into his house, and the other said, I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof. Both honored the Savior in diverse and even contrary manner. Both were weighed down with sins. Both found mercy. There is force in the comparison of the manna. As among the ancient people it tasted to each one according to what he liked, so in the heart of each Christian is that sacrament by which the world is brought into subjection. This one honors him by not daring to receive the sacrament daily, that one by not daring to let a day go by without receiving it. But that food is not to be despised, as the manna was not to be disliked. Thus, the Apostle says it is unworthily received by those who do not distinguish it from other food and do not render it the veneration eminently due. Therefore, when he says, He eateth and drinketh judgment to himself, he adds, Not discerning the body. This is very clear if all that passage of the first epistle to the Corinthians is carefully read. Suppose someone is traveling in a place where, in the continuous observance of Lent, People do not bathe or relax their fast on the fifth day of the week. And he says, I will not fast today. He is asked why. And he says, Because it is not done in my country. What is he doing but trying to make his own custom superior to another's custom? He will not quote me this from the book of God, nor assert it with the full voice of the universal church which is published everywhere nor will he show that the other acts against the faith but he in accordance with it, nor will he prove that the other violates good morals while he preserves them. To be sure, they both violate the peace and quiet of the church by quarreling about a foolish question. I should prefer that each one would not repudiate the custom of the other's country, but each do what the others do. If someone is traveling in a strange country where the people of God are more numerous, more assiduous, and more devout, and there, for example, he sees that the sacrifice is offered twice on the last Thursday of Lent, at morning and at evening, and coming back to his own country where it is customary to offer the sacrifice at the end of the day, he should claim that it is wrong and unlawful because he saw it done differently elsewhere. That childish way of thinking must be avoided for ourselves, but we must bear with it and correct it among our people. Therefore, Take note to which of these three classes your question belongs, which you set down first in your memorandum. You ask, in these words, What ought to be done on the Thursday of the last week of Lent? Is the sacrifice to be offered in the morning and again after supper, because it is said in like manner after he had supped? Or is one to remain fasting and offer it only after supper? Or is one to fast and then to sup after the offering as we are used to doing? To this, therefore, I make the answer that, if the authority of the divine scripture prescribes which of these is to be done, there is no doubt that we should do as we read, and that our discussion should turn not on how it is to be administered, but on how the sacrament is to be understood. 
Likewise, if any of these customs is common to the whole church throughout the world, it is the most unheard of madness to doubt that such a custom is to be followed. But what you ask belongs to neither of these suppositions. It follows, then, that it is of that third sort which varies according to locality and country. Let each one, then, do what he finds in that church which he attends, for none of these usages is contrary to the faith, nor do morals become better by one or other of them. For these reasons, that is, because of faith or morals, what is wrongly done should be corrected, and what is not done should be begun. But the mere change of custom, though it may be helpful, may also be disturbing because of novelty. Therefore, what is not helpful is a source of fruitless and, consequently, harmful disturbance. We are not to think that the reason for the custom in many places of offering the sacrifice on that day after the meal is because it is written, in like manner the chalice also, after he had supped, saying, for he could have called that supper their having now received the body, in order thereafter to receive the chalice. As to his saying elsewhere, when you come therefore together into one place, it is not now to eat the Lord's supper, calling this reception of the Eucharist the Lord's supper, that could rather induce men to offer or receive the Eucharist after the meal of that day, because it says in the Gospel, Jesus took bread and blessed, even though he had said above, but when it was evening he sat down with the twelve, and whilst they were eating, he said that one of you is about to betray me. But afterward he gave them the sacrament, and it is quite clear that, when the disciples first received the body, they did not receive it fasting. Is the whole church, then, to be unjustly blamed because the sacrament is always received fasting? From this time it has pleased the Holy Spirit that, in honor of so great a sacrament, no other food should enter into the mouth of a Christian before the Lord's body. That custom, therefore, is observed throughout the world. If the Lord gave the sacrament after the taking of food, that is no reason for the brethren to assemble to receive it after having dined or supped or to mingle it with their own meals, as those did whom the apostle rebuked and corrected. Our Savior commended the sublimity of that mystery with special emphasis, because he wished to impress this last gift on the hearts and memory of the disciples, whom he was about to leave to enter on his passion. Therefore, he did not give directions on the manner of its reception afterwards, in order to leave this sacred charge to the apostles, through whom he was about to institute the churches. If he had so ordained that the sacrament should always be received after other food, no one, I believe, would have changed the custom. But when the apostle, speaking of this sacrament, says, Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If any man be hungry, let him eat at home, that you come not together unto judgment. And straightway he subjoins, And the rest I will set in order when I come. We are given to understand by this that it was too much for him to set forth in a letter the whole manner of proceeding to be observed by the universal church, and that what he said in order personally is subject to no variation of custom. A certain probable explanation has appealed to some. On one fixed day of the year, when the Lord held his supper, it should be allowed to offer and receive the body and blood of the Lord after taking food, as a special form of commemoration. However, I think it came about more naturally, so that anyone who had been fasting might be able to assist at the offering of the sacrifice after the meal which is taken at the ninth hour. But we do not, for that reason, oblige anyone to sup before that banquet of the Lord, nor do we venture either to hinder anyone from doing it. I think this custom originated because many, or almost all persons in many places, were in the habit of bathing on that day, and because many were keeping the fast, the sacrifice was offered in the morning for the benefit of those who would dine, since they could not stand bathing and fasting at the same time, but it was offered at evening for the sake of those who remained fasting. If you ask how the custom of bathing arose, no more reasonable explanation occurs to me than that the bodies of those to be baptized had become foul during the observance of Lent, and they would be offensive if they came to the font without bathing on some previous day. This day was especially chosen for it, on which the Lord's Supper is annually commemorated, and, because it was permitted for those about to be baptized, 
many others wished to join them in bathing and relaxing the fast. I have discussed these points to the best of my ability, and I advise you to observe what I have hitherto said, as far as you are able and as befits a prudent and peaceable son of the church. If the Lord wills, I shall answer at another time the other questions you asked. This has been St. Augustine's Letter to Januarius, translated by Sister Wilfred Parsons, S.N.D., narrated by James T. Majewski, copyright 1951 by the Catholic University of America Press, production copyright 2020 by Trinity Communications. This podcast is brought to you by catholicculture.org and made possible by listener support. To donate, please visit catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. That's catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio.